Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Cool. All right. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Hope you all have had a good conference. We're going to talk about third-party risk management today. Disclaimer slide, necessary. OK. So just real quick introductions. My name is Brian Markham. I'm the CISO at EAB Global. We're an education technology company based out of Washington, DC. Been there for about three and a half years. Uh, and I'm Chris Castaldo. I'm the CISO at Crossbeam. We're an account mapping platform based out of Philly. Uh, and I just want to say thank you for joining us this morning. You have a lot of, op a lot of options. Uh, and I'm super excited that this is my first, uh, first talk at RSA and to, to share that with you all. So I've been thinking about these first two slides for about six months because this is an opportunity for us to have a conversation about third-party risk management, where we're at, and where I think we can go as an industry. Um, but it can't happen in just one place. It has to happen in all of our places. So I wanted to start with this quote by Peter Drucker. And y'all can read it. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> but I think it really sets the stage. Because when we think about third-party risk management, we all exist in this network, in this ecosystem. So I want to start by doing an exercise. Everyone on like the side of the room, could you just look to your right? And everyone on this side of the room, could you just look to your left? This is us. This is who fills out those questionnaires. When you ask for pen tests, we're the ones that send them to each other. When you ask for resumes for the pen testers, this is who has to respond. And so that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about the network effects of the current state of the art of third party risk management and what we collectively do to each other and what it means. Because by doing this, there are other things that we cannot do. And that's what we want to talk about today. We think that the future of TPRM and the present could be transparency, and it should be transparency. And we're going to talk about that today. But our general thesis is, is that TPRM is stealing resources from things that we could be doing to make our organizations more secure. We think we have become auditors, not risk advisors. And TPRM has become this exercise in perfection. Well, it's not about perfection. It's about reasonable assurance and making good risk-based decisions and recommendations. And then finally, independent third-party audits, assessments, industry standards should be preferred over custom questionnaires. And there's a lot of folks that don't believe this, right? And that's the conversation we're going to have today. Wait, let, let everyone take a picture of that slide. <laughs> so uh, uh, our agenda today, we're going to talk about third-party risk, the history, where it came from, why we're doing it, uh, talk about some solutions, and then uh, what we feel is a better way forward for literally all of us in this room that are having to deal with this. And we'll definitely have time for comments and questions and discussion after the fact, too. So can't wait to hear those. OK, so let's look at the state of the art and the history of third-party risk management. Before we get to like what the future can be, let's talk about what kind of where we're at. Yeah, so w what is third-party risk? What is a third party, right? That's anyone outside of our organization, suppliers, customers, investors, all of us in this room, right? Um, these are relationships that our organization takes on to achieve something, right? Maybe it's a product we buy. Uh, that adds ARR to our business. Maybe it's something that makes us more secure, right? But these all introduce risks that we, we have to manage. At the end of the day, it's, it's risk for the business, not just cyber risk, right? You know, Silicon Valley Bank, there's many other risks our organization has to manage. TPRM is a component, uh, and cybersecurity is a component of TPRM, right? So why do we do this, right? Our business wants to buy a tool, right? We want to bring something on board. I want to buy this awesome new thing that's going to be great for us. And we're the ones in cybersecurity that typically own that risk, right? We review that product. We review that thing. Uh, we review that partner. Maybe it's a tech integration. You know, we want to build an integration with something else. Um, but we, we get to this point where we want no risk, right? Zero sum game not willing to accept anything, and that's just not how our businesses work, right? You know, if there's any founders in the room, right, or you work with founders, you know starting a business is taking risks. So we've got to find the right way to do that. Um, but why do we do it, right? I think we're at the point of, you know, maybe 30 years ago when we were all doing password rotations, it felt like the right thing to do, and we know now that 
that is not the right thing to do. Um, and I think there's maybe some standards uh, that say we should do them. So who's involved, right? So obviously everyone in this room. So let's look at like two angles here, right, within the business. You have the sellers, right? That's deal desk, that's security team, legal, finance, right? These are the people after the sale, you know, the, the AE has sold it to whoever their buyer is, and now their business needs to go through the process of procuring this thing, right? Uh, sales and revenue. On the buyer side, right, that's us as customers. You've got technical buyers, executives, all these people you gotta sell to in the organization, including all those deal desk people, right? So I get to sell it to you, but now I've gotta go convince your legal team to accept our DPA, and we're not gonna sign your DPA, right? Um, and, and there's a ton of other roles. You, know, you can look at MedPIC and other great um, you know, qualification sales methodologies for that. Uh, and then you know, procurement is a transactional team in the business, right? They don't really have an, a vested interest in what you're buying, right? Oh, great, you know, Figma is gonna do these great things for our product team. You know, I'm procurement, I'm seeing all these deals, like I just wanna get to the next thing, make you happy, uh, and move this process along, right? So a lot, lot of different people involved. So we really like searched the Wayback Machine for references to third-party risk management, and the earliest one that I could find was in 1998. This uh, gentleman, Sean H. Malone, wrote a book called Third Party Risk Management, and you, I cannot find this book. If anyone has a copy of it or knows where I can find it, or if you know Sean Malone, I would love to talk to him and get a copy of this book. But that's the earliest I could find, uh, find a reference to third party risk management. I then also, uh, through my twisted imagination, decided to go back to the beginning of NIST 853 and look at all the various controls that NIST has recommended as part of the 853 standard around third party risk management. And in revision five in 2021, we actually got a bonus supply chain control family, which I actually think is a good thing. I'm really glad that we're talking about this and these standards have these new control families and, and these new controls and that we're talking about this more. This is a good thing as we all become more reliant on each other and cloud services to ship products. And then of course, if we're buyers of things, all of these components are in these products that we're buying. So this is a good thing. Um, I actually then went and did a look for mentions of supply chain in 853 through the years. This should surprise nobody, right, that we weren't talking about it at all. And now that we've seen data breaches happen to major IT suppliers, major service providers, we've seen that there is now more attention being given here. And, and again, this is a really good thing. Um, the first reference that I could find to, uh, in NIST 853 to uh, third-party risk management in the context that we're currently doing it is here in revision three. And I thought, thought it was really interesting that they talk about conducting a due diligence review of suppliers prior to entering into contractual agreements. This was really interesting because they specifically mentioned due diligence. Anyone here ever do DD for an acquisition? Okay, so y'all have some experience with this. Um, we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Uh, so, and then you may have read that there's a draft SEC guidance on third party risk management. Um, and so this is not final yet, but this was proposed uh, towards the latter end of last year. Um, and, and this I think is, is good also for publicly traded companies to be, to be doing this, these things. And so as a result of these controls and this added focus on third party risk management, supply chain security, you've seen industry standards get stood up because we know this is a slog, we know that it's hard, we know that you're never gonna have complete visibility, so let's try and standardize it to save ourselves some time. So these are some standard questionnaires that you may have filled out at your company that people may have asked you for um, if you sell product. And these are generally good things because you fill it out once and you can use it everywhere, right? But there's still a lot of them, right? And they're fairly time consuming to fill out, um, but they're still better than custom questionnaires, okay? So let's poke some holes, right? So many organizations have custom questionnaires. So all those standards that I just put up on the last slide, they don't even want them, right? They want you to fill out their custom questionnaire. And we've seen these questionnaire platforms get stood up that really enable this because they're like, you can make whatever questionnaire you want and then you can automate it. And if you wanna add more questions or have 18 different tiers based on, risk, based on the risk assessment, you can do it. So it's actually enabled us and encouraged us to do more custom questionnaires as opposed to these standard questionnaires that you can fill out once and use everywhere. 
answering certain questions spurs more questions, which spurs more questions. I'm a former auditor, and one of the things I always kept in my mind is at some point you have to stop opening doors. You open one door, there's 10 more behind it. You open that next door, there's 10 more behind it. At some point, you have to stop. How many people here have been asked for a pen test? How many people have been asked for a copy of that pen test report? How many people have been asked for detailed remediation um, plans on each finding? How many people have been asked for resumes of those pen testers? Where does it end, right? You want copies of their, uh, of their graduation, uh, of their diplomas too? Where does it end, right? So you can just keep opening more doors, but does it make anything better? Does it make anything more secure? Does it make us more able to recognize and advise on risk? I don't think that it does. In many cases, we're acting like auditors when we're really risk advisors. They don't want an opinion, right? They wanna know, if I'm gonna move forward with this tool, what are the things I need to worry about? What are the things that need to go in that contract? That's what we're in the position to advise on. How many people here routinely kill deals and procurements because of risk assessments? Okay, so a few of you. I generally try to not do this because I try and trust that the person that's buying that thing really needs that thing to get some sort of value. But what I try and do is say, if you wanna run real fast, you have to realize that there's risk that comes with that. Like if you wanna hit the gas, you gotta have the brakes, right? And I'm completely fine being the brakes to their gas. And then finally, in many cases, and this is not shade at junior analysts, the junior analysts on my team are some of my favorite people, right? But we know that a lot of the people that get saddled with this work are junior analysts. They don't always know the answers to these questions that they're putting in the questionnaires. They don't always know how to evaluate the information that they're getting. So they over-index on things that are not important. And it sucks up time, and it takes them away from other things they could be doing. Even just learning and growing and developing, they're just over-indexing on the wrong things, right? But if they're following a process, and that's the process, they do it because that's what we tell our junior analysts to do. The thing is, is in this community, we all have issues. We're all in glass houses throwing stones. When I sell something to someone, I know we're not perfect, and when I buy something from someone, I know they're not perfect. So I don't hold them to the standard of perfection. I know that they probably lack staffing that they would want or need, that they're lacking budget, that many of us lack executive support to do the things that we want to do, and many of us have tech debt. Raise your hand if you don't have any tech debt. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have all the budget you need, right? Well, one gentleman there. <laughs> I mean, awesome. Um, so we all have these similar issues, but yet we're all constantly judging each other to these really hard standards, right? And so I think about that a lot when I do these assessments. I'm like, would I want to be held to this standard of perfection? I wouldn't. But instead, I want to be able to say, hey, look, we did this. We don't think their software security program is where it needs to be. They don't do any code scanning. They haven't done a pen test, right? There could be issues. If you're okay with that though, you go right ahead. I did my job. I advised you on the risk. I think there's also this fear of transparency. If we give people more information, someone's gonna hack us. If I tell people what the vulnerabilities in my web app are, they're gonna hack us. It's like, guess what? You're, we're all getting free pen tests every day anyway, right? So if I'm giving some major financial corporation my pen test results, am I really putting myself in more risk than I already have by just putting a web app on the internet? So there's this fear of transparency that holds us back from actually being able to do all of each other a solid, right? If you give people more transparency, they have to do less digging. And that's what we all want, because we don't have a lot of time to begin with. And then finally, third-party risk management does not prevent or detect incidents. It doesn't mitigate third-party risk. Does anyone here use Twilio or LastPass? Did anyone do a vendor security review on Twilio or LastPass? And they passed, right? Did that prevent the incidents at all? No, it, do it doesn't, right? And, so, and they've got really good security programs and they pay attention to security and they've got security pages that you can go to to read about their program and how they manage encryption and all that stuff. And they still had an incident. Right? So the thing is, it's not supposed to be perfect. It's not supposed to detect any and all bad things that can happen. But yet, a lot of us find ourselves in situations where that's exactly what we're evaluating. Try and find all the bad things that could potentially happen. So for those of you that answered, that raised your hand, when we talked about, do, that have done due diligence, 
what happens when we do due diligence? We get full transparency for a limited amount of time, right? Because they're not gonna completely go all in on security. They're doing a lot of other things as part of an M&A process. But if you wanna know what are all the domains I need to worry about, what's the cloud environment I'm in, who's the person I have to call, who's this, what's the stuff that needs to be integrated day one, you can get all that information and you can get an idea of what it is you're buying, right? You're not performing an audit, you're assessing risks. And based on that, you can make recommendations on, I'm gonna need this budget, I'm gonna need this tool, I'm gonna need my wrap, to wrap my arms around this thing first. Understanding ownership and points of contact, super important, because on day one, they're your people, right? Security can kill a deal, and it has killed deals. I talked to a lot of people in the run-up to this who have killed the M&A deals over security, but it's not typically going to happen. There's a lot of financial drivers behind M&A, and a lot of the times the people that are writing the checks and making the investment, they don't care if you're doing SCA or not on that code base. They're gonna buy it anyway, right? So again, it's about being able to do a review, getting as much transparency as you can in the shortest amount of time to be able to give an opinion so you can advise on risk, so you know what to do on day one if you're then buying that company. You know, Marriott essentially bought one of the largest data breaches in history. I'm 100% sure that their DB team reviewed Starwood. I'm 100% of it, 100% sure. But the initial intrusion was in 2014, acquisition happened in 2016, and they didn't find out about it until 2018, right? It's the nature of our work. We're not playing a game of perfection. This isn't to throw shade at Marriott either. What, we're, what we do is hard, what they did is hard, and it sucks that they got saddled with this. But the point is, is even with all that information that they had at their fingertips, stuff was still missed. So these are the questions that we want you to think about as we start to go into more like what we can do collectively. Do we think we can do a better job than auditors that have hundreds of hours of access to people, documentation, and systems? Do we think that? I just got done doing eight SOC 2 audits for my various platforms. Uh, I know the amount of hours that my team spent, that the auditors spent. I can guarantee you that if something's really bad, our auditors would tell you about it if you get a SOC 2 from us. But do you think you do better with a 300, 400, 500 question questionnaire? I don't know, maybe you do. What's driving the amount of effort and resources that goes into our current processes? Who told us we need to do this? Have we only added over the years? Have we ever subtracted? Have we ever decided, what if we did less? Would we lose the value, right? Or would we save time and still keep value, right? I personally think we have only added over the years and we have never subtracted. And then finally, what are we ultimately trying to achieve? What do we wanna learn? What are gonna be those trigger points that actually kill a, kill a buy or kill a deal? And are we getting there as quickly as possible, right? So these are the things I want you all to think about. And look, I understand everyone's in a different situation Everyone's in a different industry, has different regulations, but I looked, and there's no regulation or best practice that says 500 question questionnaires are the norm, but yet people do it. And we have, we have to ask ourselves, are we doing too much? How could I use that time a little bit better? Maybe I could invest in IR or better detection, you know? So these are the types of things that I want y'all to think about. Okay, so we're gonna do a little, like, little review of the market and some of the tools that we use. That's you. Yeah. Okay. So why do we even invest in these tools, right? Um, we invest in, in a number of tools to help us with third-party risk management because we want to save time and money. If I could just get this thing, I could go from two weeks to eight hours, right? These are the types of, of economic decisions that we're making. We want the best information at the right time as efficiently as possible, right? This is all like optimal state stuff. We want to standardize to the extent possible and limit one-offs. We want to handle every single assessment the exact same way to do it any other way is gonna confuse junior people because they're not gonna, then they're gonna have to use judgment and they don't have the experience to be able to apply it well consistently. So we wanna do everything the same way if we can. And then finally, we wanna be able to educate our organization on risks. Um, that's what we wanna do, right? So we've got a number of tools and market areas that we invest in. We have these security credit scores. We have these questionnaire platforms. We've listed, and by the way, we're not throwing shade at any of these. These are wonderful companies, right? But we're just trying to have a conversation about the things that we buy and what is like the real value of that. And then we've got professional services, our auditors, the folks that are trying to standardize 
um, to make this easier for us. We're not gonna go into a ton of detail on this. Some of those I'm sure you know, so maybe some of them you don't. But what I wanna talk about high level, and this is completely subjective, this is my opinion, is uh, we gave them all a report card, right? So security credit scores, uh, are they accurate? Anyone like logged into a security scorecard or BitSite to see your credit score? How accurate do you think that is? Does my, mileage may vary, right? So, so when I was, my, my former job was at George Washington University, we have a huge network, two slash 16s. I had a huge attack surface. And I would go look at it and I'd say, well, some of that's true. And then this stuff, that doesn't belong to me, that belongs to someone else, right? So it wasn't super accurate, but there was some stuff in there that really was true, right? Was it complete? Sometimes, sometimes it's complete, but for the most part, again, sometimes you'll end up with stuff that belongs to other orgs. For the customer, now the customer's gotta pay for that. So if they want the time, the value, log in the bit site, well, what, is, what does this company do? And within five seconds, I've got a security credit score. That's amazing time, the value. But I have to pay a lot of money for that. The vendor doesn't have to pay anything for it. So it worked great for the vendor. But then as far as transparency is concerned with these security credit scores, there's secret sauce there and we don't know how that is being calculated, right? So we're just taking our word for it that if it's on a 900 to 400 to 900 scale and I'm an 850, that that's a trustworthy number that I can go with. I'm gonna worry about the five and 600s because this vendor's got, a, got an 850. But we don't really know because it's not transparent. Going down to questionnaire platforms, I asked friends last night, what grade would you give questionnaire platforms on accuracy? And they're like, if you ask the same question 10 times, oddly enough, you'll get 10 different answers. So how accurate is it really? Depending on the person filling it out, depending on the kind of day they're having. Maybe the VP of engineering is out that day, so you gotta go the next level down and they give you a worse or, or less complete answer. So mileage really varies on accuracy that is generated from questionnaires that are on these, on these questionnaire platforms. Completeness, you can cover as many controls as you want, but it comes with a, with a time cost. Um, if you're sending one to me, I have to fill it out and then you have to read it, right? So that's time on both ends. Um, the customer has to pay for that platform, but then the vendor has to pay also in the amount of time and effort that it takes to actually fill it out. Uh, time to value is really bad. Some of these things can take six weeks to turn around, right, because the questions can be uh, the questionnaires can be super long, and then someone's gotta then go review it, and then they have follow-up questions, and you do some calls and back and forth. Time to value sucks. And then the transparency, you're getting answers to your questions, but are you really getting transparency? I don't know, I don't know, I don't think so, so I gave it a C. If you look at professional services, I think this is where you start getting a little bit closer to what good could look like. Because they're accurate, because you have an auditor, an actual human, that is evaluating a control and reviewing documentation and taking samples and interviewing people, right? Doing a data center walkthrough, being in the facility, observing things. I'm not saying this because I'm a former auditor, by the way. There's definitely problems with audits, right? But as far as as accurate as you're gonna get, not doing it yourself, I think that's as good as it gets. Completeness, if anyone's gone through a SOC 2 or an ISO audit, you know that that's a re those are, these are really good control bodies, right? They cover large areas. All the questions we would wanna ask, it's in there. From a customer cost perspective, it's awesome because they don't have to pay anything for it. I have to pay for it, but I get to use it everywhere. So yeah, it's, I would rather spend that money somewhere else, but I know if I, get a, if I get the audit done once, I can use it everywhere. And we have hundreds of customers that ask for it, so that's a really good value for me. Time to value, not great. Audit gets done, in my case, in April, and I get the report in late July. That's not great time to value, but if you wanna buy from me right now, I can give you last year's SOC 2 audit and say as soon as a new report comes out, you'll have it. And then transparency, you are getting an auditor to opine on every control. And at the beginning of that report, they are actually writing up details about my security program. Details that maybe as a CISO I would give you, but you're getting it from a third party. You are not getting sugar coding. My auditors are wonderful, but they don't sugarcoat anything. So if you disagree with this, I welcome it, right? Because this is subjective. But this is the way that, that I feel about these market categories and the value that we get and the time that we spend for the investments that we make. I'm sure y'all came here with shopping lists, things that you really wanted to see, vendors you wanted to talk to. 
Um, but we spend money on some of this stuff. And we have to ask ourselves, what's really moving our program forward? So now is the best part. Now this is when we talk about what are some of the things that we're doing? What are some new approaches? What are some things that you can take with you today to audit your own programs? Because we came here today to get you all to think about this and to hopefully be better with less. So, and Chris has some great examples of the stuff that he's done at, at CrossFit. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this part. So I'll, I will read this one to you. You wanna stop. If you want to do something new, you have to stop doing something old. So that's, that's what I did at CrossBeam. So when we uh, looked at the whole program, right, there's, there's two sides, again, to this coin, like I mentioned. There's for our customers and then for us as a business, right? We're a vendor, we're also a customer, right? So looking at how we sold to companies, we're a B2B SaaS company. We have 14,000 companies on our platform. It's just me, one, one security person. I have no security engineers, it's just me. Uh, and I have been part of the problem, I'll admit that. I used to send security questionnaires to every vendor. I thought that was the way to do it. Uh, and then was on the receiving end and realized that was not good for the business, uh, and not good for the partnership that we're trying to build with our customers, right? So I want our customers to be very happy about their entire process, right? The sales process, using the tool, getting value out of it, all of that is important for you know, the life cycle of a customer. So really laser focused on the business. Uh, if anyone in here works with your revenue team, sales teams, you know time kills all deals, right? That stuff sits there, people move on, start thinking about other things, look at competitors. So getting things through that process as quickly as possible and making sure I'm not delaying things so when we have customers that have privacy concerns, EMEA, uh, GDPR concerns, security questions in like large financial institutions, I wanna make sure they have all the right information they need immediately as possible. They can assess the risk for themselves because I, I can't tell you what your risk profile is, right? I can tell you what ours is. I can give you all the information to answer your questions. So making that as transparent as possible, and, and you're gonna hear that a lot, right? So partnering with my internal sales teams and looking at our entire sales process, why do people buy us, right? Who are we selling to? What are the personas? So our buyers are typically not technical, right? These are partnership folks, channel, alliances. Um, some might be technical, but they're not, they're not the ones assessing the rest, right? Earlier we talked about what is the procurement process? Who's involved? That's all of us, right? So then your individual and your, buy, your, your buyer and your company brings that to you and says, hey, I wanna buy Crossbeam. Okay, what does it do? Oh, it connects to Salesforce, hold on. There's you know, tons of PII in there, right? Now, now we need to have a conversation. So making sure you're talking with those teams and realizing, okay, what are the questions that our customers are asking. Is it the customer, is it the buyer? Is it their procurement team? Is it legal, is it privacy, right? And if you're able to extract that type of stuff, you can build a very transparent product to give them and allow them to buy your product very quickly. So uh, the, the next bullet there, that's, that's the one I'm most excited about. So we went from questionnaires in every single deal, including free, we were answering questionnaires for free deals. Uh, we have an extensive freemium model to, to basically zero, right? Uh, and, and all that was for, for transparency. So we deployed a solution. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards, uh, if you'd like, that basically meets the sales team where they need. So we deployed a tool that's publicly facing, allows anyone to self-service and download all of our SOC 2s for the last five years every single pen test we've done for the, since the company's existence, um, our latest ISO uh, 27001 certifications, all the questionnaires we talked about earlier, right? We buy a license uh, for SIG. I don't know how many people actually buy the licenses. I've gotten, gotten some questionnaires from folks that were really close to SIG, but I know they didn't have a license uh, for it. So all of those fully completed, right? Handed to all of us, right? We're the consumers of that on a silver platter. So you can make that decision, move on to the next thing, right? 
no one in here wants to sit and review my company. You wanna go do actual things that protect your business, right? Uh, so we also increase deal velocity, right? This is the time, how long from that first contact with your prospective buyer to we have a signed deal, right? Um, it was spent about seven days in cybersecurity, right? Because that had to go to someone to fill out that questionnaire. And like Brian was talking about earlier, that could be anyone on a given day. Before I joined, it was our head of finance, our VP of people, and our CTO answering them. And I don't know about you, like when I buy a product, I would like those people focused on their expertise, right? I'd rather your CTO be focused on building an amazing product for me versus answering a bunch of questions. So, what do we do for our vendors, right? This is a two-way street, right? I, I don't know, maybe some of you are my vendor, uh, who, who knows? Uh, but I do not send security questionnaires, zero. I, I don't send them out anymore, uh, and I will not. So, you've gotta have some risk ranking, right? And, and you're all gonna do it differently. If you're in a highly regula regulated industry, I understand it, I get it, you're, you're gonna have more requirements. But we can take some of these things and apply them to our businesses. And I'm really hoping folks, folks do that and ask a lot of questions at the end here. Um, so we ask our buyers in the business, right? I wanna buy a tool, I wanna buy Figma, I wanna buy Azure, right? Na name your SaaS, uh, SaaS tool or, or cloud infrastructure. Does it cu touch customer data? Does it touch employee data? Uh, so anyone that works deal desk uh, understands why the C and the D are capitalized, right? So we're looking for material things that would be a material impact to the business. Uh, those are the questions, right? Our buyer internally to the organization has to answer, and that lets us know, okay, we need to, we need to look at the security of this product. So what do we look for? I ask, so I don't send questionnaires, but I do ask three questions, right? And I'll typically go ahead and take over the deal. I don't throw it over the fence and tell you know, that stakeholder, oh, hey, go do the review for me. Uh, that happens a lot, and I see that really often in the deals I work in, where our buyer is now saddled with their own businesses, security and legal requirements. Obviously, they're not, they're not redlining the contract, um, but this person has, has no idea what these questions mean. Right? They, they don't know how to interpret what I'm telling them. They're just like bringing it back to the business. So do they have a SOC 2 or some type of audit or certification? Do they have a pen test of the thing we are buying? And then do they have, this is really important, qualified executive responsible for cybersecurity and who do they report to? So with those three questions, whatever answers come back to me, I can evaluate the risk for Crossbeam and most of the organizations I've been at, before this I was at a, a SaaS company that did re real time uh, alerting, before that ed, ed tech company, I worked at a cybersecurity company, all these apply there. So let's say I get an answer back, I get a yes, great, you have a SOC 2. Send me the SOC 2, let me read it. What, does anyone know the, the probably two most important sections in a SOC 2? Section three, and then last, last page, which is typically management response, right, if there's exceptions, right? So I can infer really quickly the maturity of an organization of what they wrote in section three, right? In SOC 2, section three is written by the auditee, right, the organization being audited. This is in their own words. So if it's five pages and very high level, um, I can infer really quickly that it's probably not a very mature program. If it's, say, like ours, almost 45 pages, and in like excruciating detail that will put you to sleep at night, then I can infer, okay, maybe they, they understand what they're doing, they're, they're on a process, and we know there, there is no end to cybersecurity, right? Just there's no end to HR, there's no end to legal, right? It's, it's a constant process. So pen tests, right? Do you have one, do you not? Again, I can infer how mature that organization is. Uh, by the quality of the pen test. Everyone's got their own opinions about various uh, pen testing firms. Again, I can look at that pen test. Is it just the executive summary? Is it the full, you know, open, open door, all the results from the pen test? And I can tell, again, 
you know, how mature is this organization? Are they comfortable enough? And I don't expect a clean pen test. That, that is not a thing. I've never seen one in my entire career doing this 22, 23 years now. I just, I, I realize it's not a thing, but our ex expectation needs to be, you, you've got some plan in place. Just tell them, okay, yeah, you've got a critical vulnerability. I get it, like I'm not in your environment. Maybe that's not the most important thing for you to fix for your product, but you've got some plan in place. And then finally, is there someone that's qualified and responsible for security? Again, another indicator of the maturity of that organization. Yeah, have any of y'all ever bought something and tried to get someone from security on the phone or email and gotten nothing? How does that make you feel? Especially if you're a security person, how does it make you feel? Probably not good, right? And so for me, that last bullet is, is the most important one for me. I, I, in the last three years, went from being a buyer to being both a buyer and a seller, and it hit me very quickly that that last one, just being able to say, hi, I'm Brian, I'm the CISO, I'm your CISO today before you sign the contract, and I'm your CISO tomorrow after you sign the contract. I said, I'm gonna be that change I wanna see in the world, that if you pick up the phone, if you have a concern, that I'm gonna be there, because I understand how important that is to sh demonstrating that you have a functional security program, being accountable to it, and being ready and willing to answer questions whenever you get them. That's part of the CISO role, in my opinion. So these are some of the things we want you to think about, and we're gonna talk about applying it in a moment. What degree of transparency can you provide that maybe you're not providing today? Does anyone generate SBOMs? If anyone's selling software, anyone generating SBOMs? Does anyone share those SBOMs with their customers? Awesome, right? Uh, anyone, uh, you remember back when the, the Log4 shell vulnerability came out? Y'all probably went out to your vendors and said, do, are you using this library? Did, what, how did that process go? Highly manual or did you know exactly who was using it, right? W if you didn't have an SBOM or if you weren't doing SCA, uh, software composition analysis, it might have been really hard to figure that out. Um, so again, transparency is really great for those types of questions that can come up you know, during the relationship with that provider. Um, so everyone's risk tolerance is gonna be a little bit different, but again, just asking yourself, what's the outcome that we're trying to achieve? How often, to what degree, how much time should it take, how much should we spend to get there? And if we use a standard, how often do we deviate from it? Maybe you can bring that in a little bit. Really, I want you to walk away from this and audit yourself. Ask these questions, look at the data, talk to your teams. We did a very small survey of a bunch of CISOs in the run-up to this, and we asked them how long it takes them, the value that they get, and we said, and how confident are you in these numbers? A lot of them weren't confident at all that they even had the data to understand how much it costs and how much time it spends to actually do this on both sides, both the seller and the buyer, right? So just having that data or having a way to reliably get it and analyze it is super eye-opening. And we've just done that in the last couple of years, so I can tell you exactly how many hours we've spent doing third-party risk management over the last 24 months. I used to not be able to do that. Okay, so what does good look like, right? My perspective, of course. Um, if in your org, a documented formal approach to TPRM that has a policy that's supported by executive leadership, so everyone's on the same page, having a formal contract with that third party with security and privacy requirements in that contract so they've agreed to do something and it could be breach if they don't do it. A method to identify new third parties because that's a problem too, they don't always tell us. Um, and then prioritize based on business impact. A standard documented assessment methodology with provisions to perform reassessments. Maybe that's just get the SOC 2 and ask for a new one every year. And then some degree of continuous monitoring, right? So minimum questions, do you have a SOC 2? Do you have a penetration test? Who's that qualified executive? Do you have cyber insurance? That's a really important question that I ask. Where does my data go and who are the downstream processors? I wanna know that. Asking for a data, uh, data flow diagram, um, most companies have these ready, at least at a high level, so that I understand, okay, they're using AWS, they're using Snowflake, they're using SendGrid, awesome, right? We use a lot of those companies too. So next week, Enjoy, your, you know, enjoy the rest of the day, enjoy tomorrow, enjoy the weekend, but Monday, audit your TPRM program. How can you integrate transparency as a core principle 
in your TPRM program on whatever side you're on. Some of you are probably on both. How much time am I spending? How much money am I spending? Am I checking a box or am I providing real value? Quite frankly, does anyone even give a shit that I spend as many hours as I do on this process? Do people see the value or am I doing it because I feel like I need to do it? These are all questions where we have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves. What's the least amount I can do to achieve the outcome and provide real value and drive to that? So only you can do these, this audit and answer these questions. But in the first three months, my hope would be you will have completed this audit. You will have talked to folks throughout your org, talked to your teams, and drawn up a future state where your effort is minimized to still achieve the outcomes that you need. And the outcomes that the business has agreed is valuable. Within six months, this future state should begin to take shape. You can start planning investments differently. You can maybe reallocate funds. But these are really the questions. What are the old things have we, that we stopped doing? What are the new things that we've started doing? And can we measure our investments and the outcomes? Can we show the value from all this time that we spend? And that's something that I think we all work to do, to show the value and talk about the value that we provide. It's important for getting buy-in to your security program. So to summarize, we believe that transparency is the future of TPRM. And we believe that the current state can be better and should be better. We believe that TPRM steals resources from other security domains and doesn't make anything more secure. We believe that TPRM is not about perfection, it's about reasonable assurance. That is a good outcome. And we believe, finally, that independent third-party audits, certifications, and industry standards are way better than custom questionnaires. So, a couple things. First of all, thank you very much for coming this morning. We know you have a lot of options and we are psyched that you are all here. We've been working on this for six months and talking about it for years. So we're so psyched that you joined us this morning. I wanna say thank you to Christina Richmond, Avinash Kandu, Kevin Alston, and Zarmina Wasim for helping us with research and analysis to get this done. I also wanna note that there is a book signing. Yes. Chris wrote a book. Details? Uh, Startup Secure basically uh, wrote it for all of our founders, right? Non-technical folks to be able to apply security before they hire us, uh, and then we're not fixing uh, security debt. Uh, so 11 o'clock uh, in the RSA bookstore, and it'll be 20% off as well. Yeah. I have two copies of the book, it's really good. Um, and then finally, those are our email addresses. If you, if you don't have time, don't wanna ask questions or talk to us now, um, shoot us an email and any and all feedback is super welcome. I don't know if we'll do this talk again, but we're, never, we're not gonna stop thinking about it. And we hope that you all will not stop thinking about it either until at least you get back on Monday and start asking yourself some of those questions. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Do we have time for, yeah. We have like eight minutes, I think, if people wanna step up to mics or yell at us or throw tomatoes. <laughs> There's one. Can you go to the mic so everyone can hear you? So I have a question for you, Chris. Yeah. You said you asked three questions. What happens if any one of them comes back as a no, or for, for the matter, let's say, depending upon the scope of your engagement, outsourcing engagement, where you would require a SOC report, but it's not available. They just have a pen test report. And then second question is like, pen test is not relevant to most of the engagement, let's say. So what do you do there? So uh, in that scenario, right, so they don't have it, then we've got to look for other mitigating controls, right? So maybe that is adding stronger language in the contract. If we really need to buy this thing, yes. maybe it's asking for uncapped liability, right? And look for different areas to get the same effect to reduce risk, right? Maybe I'm not going to prevent a data breach, but we reduce the risk for the business in, in some other way. So come what me, you avoid sending questionnaires. Is that right? Yes. So this, does this work for companies outside of US or developed economies? Uh, I, I would think so. I, I think it would apply to, okay. to any, any organization buying any SaaS product. Okay, okay. Anyway, I'll just email you to everyone then because I got other thoughts. I don't want to monopolize the time here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, this is a great talk. My name is Bryant. Uh, a question, uh, you, you all pointed out 
uh, kind of the time that's leached from other teams within InfoSec um, and providing many of these resources up front, pen test reports, I presume other reports too if we have it, right, uh, that from tooling or what have you. Um, how much of that underlying infrastructure also had to be set up? Let's say auto-generating uh, the various reports from different parts of the InfoSec org uh, in order to pave the road for being able to publish this material. Um, that's part one. I might have uh, kind of a second layer to that question is, um, do you still require NDAs prior to access to said portal? Uh, so for us, uh, so we use a product called SafeBase. It took maybe an hour to upload everything. We already had quite a bit of that content, just wasn't available for someone to download. Uh, we do require a click-through NDA. We use bond terms. If anyone's not familiar with them, go check them out. Amazing organization trying to change the legal side of this problem, right? Getting red lines out of deals. Um, but yeah, I, we include material information in our SOC 2 and pen test, so, so yeah, we do require an NDA. But if you're already looking at buying our products, then that, that process is already pretty natural. Got it, thank you. Thanks. You guys talk about using SOC 2s as it's kind of like the, the goal, right, is to have that. When you have SaaS solutions, though, that are hosted in Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, they point to their SOC 2, their SOC 2 <laughs> says, we don't know, it depends. That's normally where questionnaires come into play, right? Because you can't get comfortable with the SOC 2 because it says nothing, right? So what is the gap there that, you know, that can be filled without a questionnaire? Sure, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Sending me the SOC 2 for AWS does not apply to your business, right? right. That, yeah. that, is, that is not a thing. <laughs> um, and also, if you, if you read the terms when you download that from AWS, it says it can't be shared with a third party, so uh, people doing that are, are violating an NDA. Uh, again, it goes back to, okay, what other things does this business have? Maybe asking a couple other questions, uh, and then it's, it's up to me and the business stakeholder to figure out if we accept that risk for the business, right? Again, we said that earlier, everyone's gonna have a different risk profile. I might be more willing to take risk on something, uh, but like maybe I, I'm not willing to take risk on an HRAS system with no security team, no SOC 2, that's gonna have all my employees SSNs, right? Um, our customers don't care about that, but I care about that. That's, that's my responsibility to the business. Okay, thank you. So I've got an interesting use case in that we get audited by our customers all the time. And it's not security people doing the audits, it's auditors from other business portions. So it often devolves into the rabbit hole of either what's this mean or something that's really not applicable. Do you have any best practices for managing that communication and that transparency? Because that is one of the main blockers I've got to doing more by way of the transparency. Yep, so uh, my first would be partnering with legal and pushing as hard as possible to remove those audit clauses. I don't know what your business is, so it, it could be not not removable, right? So I, I get that. Yeah. Um, and then it's really, I would say, working with the revenue team and adding that cost into a deal, right? That costs your time, that costs your team's time. Um, I, I worked at a, uh, company that sold into the telecom space, um, and we allowed all these, all these uh, telecom companies to audit us, and I went through the same experience, and that just became a baked in part of the budget at that point where it's, where it's totally unavoidable. Yeah. Um, and, and that was my point to the regulated industry. Some, sometimes it's just not possible. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add to that that I really scrutinize the right to audit clauses. As a former auditor, I know that it's, it's rabbit hole central. So what I try and do is, is use the term reasonable, like you know, um, you know, what would be reasonable, what wouldn't be reasonable, and ask for rules of behavior um, as the condition for any audit um, so that we don't get into those time suck, open up a door, 10 more, open up the, that door, 10 more, and so on. So I don't know if that's stuff that you can do in your contracts, but I've really kind of overly scrutinized that because we put that in all of our contracts because our customers want it. And I understand the impact that that could have on our team and our ability to run a security program if everyone were to say we want to audit you at the same time. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been uh, at, at Crossbeam. I've been strong arms. You know, 
Maybe there's two commas in the deal and we're willing to accept that risk, uh, but there's an hourly cost that we set and that's in the audit clause and there's no price there. It's just, we'll set it at the time of the audit, right? So there's gotta be some thinking. Thanks. My name is Lynn. I work in healthcare. Uh, so we're quite highly regulated. Have you heard of this approach working in uh, regulated industries? So Lynn, I'm gonna, I'll take that. I think that, and you can disagree with me on this. I think a lot of time when we work with healthcare companies, a lot of times no one tells the security team what they're actually buying. So they act like they're buying a medical record system or some sort of medical device that's gonna be on the internet, when in reality, we might just be collecting people's emails. And so I like to start there with making sure that people that are buying from us know exactly what they're buying. At the end of the day though, and this is the second part, we understand that you have requirements that you need to meet and I think just being transparent with the requirements as a seller and making sure that like, look, I'm doing what I need to do because I'm required to do it. Here's the best way to get there and not be adversarial because I feel sometimes like a seller that someone comes in with the big regulatory stick and they're gonna hit us with it because they can. Going in with that spirit of partnership to save time on both sides has helped me in these exchanges. 